Hey guys, thanks for joining me again for another episode of my YouTube channel, Long Live the Brains. We're going to wrap up the series on diet and Parkinson's disease by talking about a diet that's become very popular, and that's the keto diet. So you may have heard of it, and uh, what we're really referring to, or what the goal is in the keto diet, is to get the body in a state of ketosis. Now, it's important to understand where we get our fuel from so that you can understand what ketosis is. One side of the equation, or one, one, we've got glucose and carbohydrates, and we've got ketones on the other side. So glucose is pure sugar, and we can get that almost instantaneously when we consume carbohydrates. Um, we can also get glucose from the breakdown of fats and, and even from proteins um, through a few more biochemical steps. But really, kind of the emphasis is carbohydrates and glucose. On the other side, we have ketones, which we can also um, use to carry out biochemical processes and um, generate ATP, which is the energy molecules in our body. Okay, So we're in kind of this balance between carbohydrates and ketones. Now, most of our diets, if it's an unintentional diet, we've got lots of carbohydrates in them, and so we're going to be kind of shifted towards carbohydrates. But if we decrease the amount of carbohydrates in our diet, then the scales tip and we put the emphasis on ketones and then our body can become in a state of what we call ketosis. All right. So that's the premise behind the keto diet. And even though maybe the terminology may be a little bit newer, there are many diets that have been around for many years that actually stress some of the same concepts, but maybe not to the to the same degree. Um, those might include diets like the Paleo diet or the Atkins diet, which I'm sure many of you have heard of. So because of the popularity of these diets, many people have asked the question, well, what impact does this have on our general health and can it be used to combat specific diseases such as Parkinson's disease, which is obviously why I'm talking about it today. Now, this is a tough trial to do and we oftentimes um, will, I think it's important at this point to kind of take a step back and talk about evidence in whether or not something works. So we have different levels of evidence within, uh, within science. And the lowest level of evidence is going to be anecdotal evidence. And that's basically like if we were sitting across the table from each other and I said, um, so to use the example from the last video, I said, hey, I've got gout. And, you know, I tried uh, this treatment and it, uh, you know, it was a treatment that I just decided to try on my own and my gout got better. So I think this works for gout. You ought to try it. Well, that doesn't really tell you that the treatment worked. We can't really prove that that was an effective treatment because you can't clone that person and go back in time and say, okay, um, this is you with your gout and trying your treatment and this is you with your gout and not trying your treatment and we follow you in time and see which one gets better and if the the version of you that tried your treatment got better and the version of you that didn't try the treatment did not get better well then maybe your treatment was what caused the gout to get better maybe it was going to get better on its own but what we try to do to get a, a better or higher level of evidence, in fact the highest level of evidence, is something called a randomized control trial. And we're just trying to prove kind of the same thing and we take a large group of people and we randomize them. So randomization is supposed to take into account or balance the differences of people within a big group. So um, you know, you have two groups and we want to have roughly the, um, you know, same age of people. We want to have roughly the same percentage of male to female ratio. If we're talking about Parkinson's disease, we want to have roughly the same disease severity. Uh, maybe uh, be on similar medication regimens so that um, the, the groups for the most part are fairly identical. That way, when you apply the intervention or the treatment, if there is a difference between the two groups, you can blame that difference or credit that difference to the intervention rather than some kind of inherent difference between the two groups. Okay, So trying to apply that to a diet is really tough. Um, and there are many biases that can be incorporated into those kinds of things. Ideally, um, you would 
you would um, uh, blind the what we call blind the participant to their treatment. So if we're giving a, a drug uh, and you have two groups in a trial, uh, you may give one group the actual drug and you may give the other group uh, a, a tablet or, or whatever that looks exactly the same, but it's not actually the drug, it's what we call a placebo. That way both groups um, think they're getting the treatment and that removes a, a certain bias because if you think you're getting the treatment or if you think you're not getting a treatment, um, uh, we know that uh, that can actually impact someone's impression on how they're doing. So when we try to construct a, a solid and um, well thought out study, we're trying to think about all these biases and what factors we need to control for so that when we come up with results, we know that they're real, they're reliable, and it's something that we can apply, um, you know, in the case of medicine, to our practice. And there was actually a study that tried to do that with the keto diet. This came out in a uh, journal called Movement Disorders uh, towards the end of 2018, so it's a very new study. And the authors took about, uh, I've got the study here, they took uh, roughly 40 patients and they divided them into two groups. And, and again, everyone has Parkinson's disease. And one group was on the keto diet and another group was on a low fat diet. So the keto diet had, again, low carbs, high fat, and the low fat group had low fat, high carbs. And basically the protein content between the two groups was essentially the same. They followed the groups for eight weeks and then measured their uh, symptoms of Parkinson's disease using the UPDRS. And that's a, um, well, a, a standardized rating scale so that we can quantify symptoms related to Parkinson's disease. And we look at both the motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease as well as the non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. And what the authors found was at the end of the eight week mark, both diets showed improvements in the UPDRS scale. Um, but they noticed that it was only the keto diet that, or excuse me, um, uh, that the keto diet showed more of an improvement than the low fat diet in the first section of the UPDRS, which corresponds with the non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. They didn't find a significant difference when it comes to the motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. Now, another thing to always consider when we're looking at how, um, looking at the quality of a study is how many of the participants were actually able to complete the whole study. And in the keto group, there were 24 people. And it's important to note that two of those people had to drop out or chose to drop out uh, because their symptoms of tremor and other motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease were actually worsened. Now the other group, the, the low fat diet, didn't have anyone drop out for those reasons. So it's, it's a relatively small sample size and it's hard to you know, say that that means that it worsens the motor symptoms. Um, I, I think because this is a relatively small study, it really just shows that it's feasible to apply these diets but as far as their actual effect against Parkinson's disease and improvements in the symptoms, the jury's still out. So this study is a nice study that shows that it can be done and it will probably catalyze um, future studies to be done so that we can really answer that question. So right now there's not compelling evidence that um, the ketogenic diet um, is protective against Parkinson's disease or improves the symptoms. We just don't have the evidence. So that's not to say that it, it works and it's not to say that it doesn't work. But I will caution you, um, the keto diet, if you're following a strict keto diet, this can be um, a very difficult diet to start. And in fact, um, if you have certain conditions, starting this diet can actually be harmful to your health. So if you're considering starting this diet, I urge you to discuss it with your physician um, and, uh, and only do so under his or her guidance and, and potentially even with the guidance of a nutritionist. 